While I do not share the idea that surviving one's spouse is nature's greatest gift, some Victorians did. Welcome back, ladies and gentlefolk. Today we're going to talk about Victorian morning fashion, the grieving, and how it became fashionable. Would you believe if I tell you that a dead husband can make you hot? This is usually not what we understand under the phrase drop that gorgeous, but what if I tell you that stoic, cumbersome Victorian morning blazed the way to what we know today as the little black dress, which is the mark of the well-embraced feminine sexuality. Historians suggest that Victorian morning fashion is the antecedent, the sexier vamp fashion that followed. As Jill Fields writes, the move to the vamp black became possible because of the growing presence of black outerwear from women readily available in the 19th century due to the extensive morning rituals merged with the growing sensibility that dressing, that dressing black is fashionable. A quick recap on uh, on Victorian morning costumes, which we are not going to delve deep into today, because it's it requires a longer breath of analysis from other from our 21st century viewpoint. But let's see some some recap. Following Queen Victoria's example, it became customary for families to to go through elaborate rituals to commemorate the deceased. This included wearing mourning clothes, retiring from society for a while, having lavish funerals, including that they popularized huge, beautiful family crypts, and erect massive and monumental graves which also worked well against the growing uh, industry of, uh, of organ trades. Morning clothes were the family's outer display of inner grief. The rules were complicated and mostly aimed for women. The morning period in general has two phases, full morning and half morning. Full or deep morning requires all black Full or deep mourning is where the outerwear is black, non-reflective fabric, which does not reflect light. It sort of symbolizes that the widow has the light taken out of their life, and the person essentially becomes that itself that does not reflect the light of life, and wailed and shielded from the living. At half morning, dresses could be accessorized and trimmed with grays, purples, and whites. Visitors can be accepted, and this is sort of a transition for the mourner back to society and back to life, back to the way of the living. Bigger the performance of grief, greater the love and loss. There is a set period of mourning. It is two years for a husband, where one year spent in full mourning and one in half mourning. One year for parents, one year for children. Six months for grandparents, six months of friends, if the mourner received inheritance. Six months for siblings and three months for an aunt or an uncle. Superstitions were greatly present, especially surrounding death itself. In Victorian society, superstitions were galor in general, but around death there were certain, certain superstitions prevailed all through Victorian times, and few of them are carrying the dead out of the house with legs first, so they can't look back and take somebody with them, covering mirrors so the deceased face cannot be trapped into the mirror, and stopping the clock when the death kicks in. Mirrors kept being covered until the funeral has been conducted completely. 
They also made a lot of extra steps to, to protect their graves from, uh, from the little helpers of Victorian medical revolutionaries, aka grave robbers. Widows mourning clothes announced the ongoing bounds of fidelity that were expected to tie women to their, to their husbands for at least two years after their death. And then? What after? What if I tell you? It's freedom. A widow's life is not as bad as one might think. Although analysis on Victorian morning dress is famously impossible due to the lacking of first-hand experiences and first-hand sources and non-existent contemporary grief counselors. What we can all agree on that in this case the participation in the system what the participation in the system what is meaningful sources that that uh, has been examined for this particular study do focus on women who lost their husband obviously we do not argue that losing a husband losing a parent losing a sibling or a mother is an immeasurable loss i do not agree with the with the victorian intention to put this put this burden of carrying out the grieving solely on women while men can get away with having a little sash worn on their coats i do agree that this period of alone time this period of gazing inwards can help moving on And while this is not everyone's cup of tea, there are a number of sources from the 1840s going on suggest that women with intention used their grieving attire, controlled the emotional message it communicated, and actively negotiated the marketplace of mourning goods to assert erotic, social, and, and economic agency. Literature is full of contradicting stories about wealthy widows, sad widows, overtly pious women who all took their newfound agency to a new level of or either indulging or denying it. Openly giddy, overjoyed widows are rare in Victorian fictions. But the dress descriptions, they are rivaling even with the joy of finding a perfect wedding dress. The desire of showing up untouchable and tantalizing and desirable or underpinning the whole fictional narrative. Such feelings are evident in the disconnect between the suggestions of advice columns in Victorian newspaper and, and in ladies' magazines and the image of fashion plates and advertisements. If we take these two together, we get a much more precise intersection of on all of unalloyed joy and utter misery. A certain ambivalence that seems to be closest we can get to the reality of a grieving widow. All in all, widowhood is a process with a clear end goal, where the person emerges as a butterfly from the chrysalis of grieving attire, alive, experienced, and looking good in black. Obviously not all them proper folks were all over the expens expensive and ostentatious rituals. And the last half of the 19th century was harsh from the call of the reform around mourning and grieving. Passing time gave away to progress, as it does. The ongoing debate on the meaning of mourning dresses, especially from the side of the aesthetic movement and the rational dress movement, changing marital expectations changed the way people has grieved. Marital expectations changed, changed the requirements of grieving itself. The access to 
Divorce lightened the burden of performance that was once attached to the institution of Victorian marriage and subsequently to widowhood. This last bit actually raised the life expectancy of men in certain parts of the world. Black evening dresses, evening dresses started to gain popularity even as early as 1860s. But as contemporary literature suggests, it still communicated sexuality and provocativeness. The decisive battle between the sad black dress and sexy black dress could be pinpointed to one even specifically that we call the Black Ascot. The Black Ascot happened in 1910, which took place a few weeks after the death of Edward VII. That was the point where the move started. The clock started to tick to end the sadness and woe that ruled over the black attire. Nevertheless, people capitalized over the emotional content of the apparel, but at that moment, at that event, people looked at each other and we can imagine having this conversation. Wow, you look hot! Wasn't long enough uh, till someone, someone vaguely important, bought into the trend and that was Coco Chanel. It would be an obvious mistake to entrust the invention of the little black dress to Chanel herself only. So we cannot, inventor of the of the little black dress is solely could be put on Chanel herself. Since the negotiations over the meaning of this dress has been way on the way. It was woman who took an aspect of an agreeably oppressive patriarchal ritual and transformed into something new and useful. What we can definitely say and what cannot be taken away from her, that Coco Chanel put thoughts behind this marketing, what she has done on the little black dress. She looked at the very simple yet very provocative dress and which has been scrutinized for both of these characteristics and might have thought it's all fine and dandy but why wait to wear it be until someone croaks? She got rid of the dead relatives metaphysically and figuratively. She spread the message and got rid of those pesky sad tones from the the, the black dress. Her critics, because they had been many, caught her out on the simplicity of the apparel, calling it poverty deluxe, soup kitchen style, and poor girl fashion, seemingly flabbergasted over the blurring of the class lines in fashion, axing her further on the accessibility, the luxuriousness of those clothes she produced all on the style and being generally bummed over the fact that people can dress out of their class, they can dress above and they can dress below, and nobody penalizes it. There is no social scrutiny around wearing black dress without your relatives being six feet under. All in all, the characteristic that define the little black dress, the possibility to communicate multiple and conflicting meanings, the potential to embody complex and ambivalent desires, and the feminine side of control afforded by fashion, it also de define the morning attire. Other kind of fashion may be used to reach similar goals, but the 20th century black fashion depended on a set of cultural connotations, social restrictions, and gender roles. It all depended on the color black, a uniquely powerful, mysterious, and seductive color that can be both understood pious and perverse at the same time. Thank you for coming with me on this adventure, ladies and gentlemen. folk. At the next video, we're going to continue with our sewing journey and as we are entering into autumn, we're going to do something very, very seasonable. Halloween is also upon us. Keep an eye on the channel. Until next time.